Cells are the smallest living units of an organism. All cells have three things in common, no matter what type of cell they are. All cells have a cell membrane, which separates the inside of the cell from its environment, cytoplasm, which is a jelly-like fluid, and DNA, which is the cell's genetic material. There are two broad categories of cells. The first category is eukaryotic cells. They have organelles, which include the nucleus and other special parts. Eukaryotic cells are more advanced, complex cells, such as those found in plants and animals. The second category is prokaryotic cells. They don't have a nucleus or membrane-enclosed organelles. They do have genetic material, but it's not contained within a nucleus. Prokaryotic cells are always one-celled or unicellular organisms, such as bacteria. So what are organelles? Organelle means little organ. Organelles are the specialized parts of a cell that have unique jobs to perform. Let's start with the nucleus, the control center of the cell. The nucleus contains DNA, or genetic material. DNA dictates what the cell is going to do and how it's going to do it. Chromatin is the tangled, spread out form of DNA found inside the nuclear membrane. When a cell is ready to divide, DNA condenses into structures known as chromosomes. The nucleus also contains a nucleolus, which is a structure where ribosomes are made. After ribosomes leave the nucleus, they will have the important job of synthesizing or making proteins. Outside the nucleus, the ribosomes and the rest of the organelles float around in cytoplasm, which is the jelly-like substance. Ribosomes may wander freely within the cytoplasm or attach to the endoplasmic reticulum, sometimes abbreviated as ER. There are two types of ER. Rough ER has ribosomes attached to it, and smooth ER doesn't have ribosomes attached to it. The endoplasmic reticulum is a membrane-enclosed passageway for transporting materials, such as the proteins synthesized by ribosomes. Proteins and other materials emerge from the endoplasmic reticulum in small vesicles, where the Golgi apparatus, sometimes called the Golgi body, receives them. As proteins move through the Golgi body, they're customized into forms that the cell can use. The Golgi body does this by folding the proteins into usable shapes or adding other materials onto them, such as lipids or carbohydrates. Vacuoles are sac-like structures that store different materials. Here, in this plant cell, the central vacuole stores water. Going back to the animal cell, you will see an organelle called a lysosome. Lysosomes are the garbage collectors that take in damaged or worn out cell parts. They are filled with enzymes that break down this cellular debris. The mitochondrion is an organelle that is the powerhouse for both animal and plant cells. During a process called cellular respiration, the mitochondria make ATP molecules that provide the energy for all of the cell's activities. Cells that need more energy have more mitochondria. Meanwhile, the cell maintains its shape through a cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton includes the thread-like microfilaments, which are made of protein, and microtubules, which are thin, hollow tubes. Some organisms 
such as plants, that are photoautotrophic, meaning they capture sunlight for energy, have cells with an organelle called a chloroplast. The chloroplast is where photosynthesis happens. It's green because it has a green pigment called chlorophyll. Plant cells also have a cell wall outside of their cell membranes that shape, support, and protect the plant cell. Animal cells never have a cell wall. There are many other unique structures that only some cells have. Here are just a few. In humans, for example, the respiratory tract is lined with cells that have cilia. These are microscopic hair-like projections that can move in waves. This feature helps trap inhaled particles in the air and expels them when you cough. Another unique feature in some cells is flagella. Some bacteria have flagella. A flagellum is like a little tail that can help a cell move or propel itself. The only human cell that has a flagellum is a sperm cell. All right, guys, so that was a intro video from Nucleus Medical Media that make really good videos, as you can see. So we're just going to get into it. Today we're talking uh, cell structures, cell anatomy. We're going to do eukaryotes. We're going to do bacteria and archaea. It's going to be great. Cell theory, they mentioned briefly. Uh, so everything's made of cells. We've talked about this before. Cells are the most basic structural unit of living things, and cells can only come from other cells. Doesn't matter what it is, if it's a cell and it's alive, then it came from another cell. It is a cell, it's the smallest unit. We're gonna start talking about eukaryotic cells, okay? So they're big, I mean, we as humans are eukaryotes, so we're really big. Uh, we have membrane-bound organelles. We're gonna talk more about what a membrane actually is. So that's a phospholipid bilayer. Um, and so we're gonna talk more about that later, but if you use phospholipid bilayers all over your cell, then uh, those are membrane-bound organelles, and that's a trait of eukaryotes. And so that includes, you know, your mitochondria, your nucleus, all that good stuff. We're going to talk about those. You can be single-celled eukaryote, uh, but you can also be multicellular. That's usually what we think of. Uh, but um, you don't always have a cell wall, which is going to come up. Bacteria do always have cell walls, uh, but we don't always. Uh, plants do. Uh, and funguses do, and those are eukaryotes, but uh, humans and mammals tend not to. Uh, and so let's talk about the organelles. So we're going to talk about those. Organelle means little organ. And uh, we're really just interested in all the processes that occur inside of cells. And so if you look at this picture of a cell, you can see all these different compartments. And that's the whole point of membranes, of phospholipid bilayers, is separating things into compartments. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the specifics of what makes a membrane and like how we transfer things and like the point of a membrane. But first, we're going to talk about eukaryotes and the different compartments that are inside of a eukaryotic cell. So we're going to go through those uh, organelles. So the first one that we hit is the nucleus. And that's, of course, the storage compartment for your DNA. Its main job is to keep that nice and organized so that your RNA polymerases can then grab onto the DNA and make RNA. Uh, in general, we tend to think about, at least in a class like this, we think about messenger RNA. There are other types of RNA, uh, ribosomal RNA being the other uh, most common one, as well as transfer RNA, which is what ribosomes use. Uh, we're going to talk about ribosomes in just a second. Uh, it's a double phospholipid bilayer, so it's not just a single one. It is a double phospholipid bilayer, and there's nuclear pores that allow things to come in and out. Uh, there are multiple subcompartments of the nucleus. Uh, the nucleolus is the most common one. That's where we make ribosomal RNA as opposed to messenger RNA. That's, uh, there are other subcompartments uh, in, in cell biology. We talk about those, uh, but in this class, we tend not to, except the nucleolus, which is kind of cool. Looks like a little egg yolk right there. Uh, and so uh, chromatin is your DNA plus your proteins that keep it organized, so your histones, which there's multiple versions of that, uh, or multiple proteins that act as histones. Uh, if it's nice and dense, so these are archaic terms, heteroneuchromatin. I don't really like those terms. I never test people on those terms. Uh, if you condense your DNA really tight and squeeze it really tight, it's hard to get access to. So it's really hard to get your RNA polymerases to go in and make messenger RNA off of really dense, condensed chromatin. And so if you loosen it up, it's easier to perform transcription, uh, which is making messenger RNA. And so that's the difference. And so inside the nucleus, some, some regions are nice and tightly packed so that they're, they're kind of stored for later, or maybe we just don't want to use the genes that are coded inside of there. And then some, uh, you, some chromatin, euchromatin, uh, is nice and decondensed or loose chromatin. 
And so you can access that DNA really well and do transcription. That's generally the main job. Uh, the, the main processes that occur inside, transcription is the big one, but replication, of course. I mean, if you're going to double your cells, you have to undergo replication, and that happens. Uh, and then uh, you can modify your nucleic acids, too. Uh, the intent of that is like, uh, like splicing for RNA, uh, which we will talk about at a later time. Now, ribosomes, we need to talk about ribosomes. So ribosomes are these massive enzymes that facilitate the production of proteins. Uh, but basically, they just take these, they have two pieces, they have a large subunit and a small subunit, and there's a big one and a small one, and you just stick your messenger RNA in between, and you use that as your guide. And so your transfer RNA comes in that has amino acids attached on one end, and it sort of bridges the gap, and we are translating, that's the process that ribosomes perform, is translation. And translation is going from the language of nucleic acids to the language of amino acids, and they're very different languages. So nucleic acids are A's and T's and C's and G's. Amino acids have a lot more variety. There's 20-ish amino acids that we can use to build our proteins. And so you need to translate between nucleic acids, which only have four bases, to amino acids, which have 20. And so that's the job of the ribosome to use the, uh, it kind of facilitates all of this happening. Uh, and subcomponents of the ribosome are made inside the nucleolus. That's where the ribosomal RNA comes from. Uh, ribosomes are comprised of both RNA, ribosomal RNA, as well as protein. They're like this giant amalgamation of all these proteins and RNAs that are stuck together, which is really, really cool. They're very interesting. So we're going to move on to the endomembrane system, which kind of bridges the gap. So you can see we're, we're starting inside the nucleus and we're moving out, okay? And so we're going to take some of those ribosomes and we can stick them onto what we call the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a component of the endomembrane system. So, which sounds super cool, all it is is all the little compartments that we use to keep things sequestered from each other. Uh, like lysosomes are where we put enzymes that break stuff down or if you need to break a protein down, you'll send it to like a lysosome. And you don't want the enzymes that break down proteins to be just floating around. You wanna keep them nice and stored somewhere. And so that's what the endomembrane system's job is. So if you're a cell that needs to secrete something like a hormone, then you're gonna make the, the hormone, which is probably a protein, and you're going to stick it into your endomembrane system and have it sent out of the cell. And so that's what the job of the endomembrane system, which uh, is generally considered the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, which I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, but we tend to lump, uh, sometimes the Golgi body gets lumped in there, sometimes vesicles get lumped in there. For this class, we're going to lump them all together. Uh, but those are technically different organelles, but hey, we're going to kind of smash them all together. It's going to be great. Uh, the things that happened, uh, translation, uh, which is happens in the rough ER, which let's talk about that. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, so the, the ER is continuous with the nuclear membrane, which is kind of kind of a trippy thing. I like this picture a lot. You can see uh, we've got that nucleus with the nuclear pores. That's those funny looking flower things. And then you can see we've got our rough ER. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, is a phospholipid bilayer that has ribosomes bound to it. Now, the ribosomes actually are free-floating, and then when they grab onto a messenger RNA that has a specific signal, that tells it to make the protein that it's going to make, because that's what ribosomes do, and we want to like either secrete that protein or have it embedded in a membrane, then that signal tells the ribosome to bind to the ER, and that's the rough ER. It's nice and close to the nucleus because that's where the messenger RNA is. Why would you have your ribosomes like way over here when the RNA is right, right here? Like That way I don't have to move it like across the whole cell. Uh, so that's kind of cool. So that's mainly the job of the rough ER is to sort of act as the, the entry point for protein production. Uh, now the smooth ER is just a, kind of the next step. And you can see here, this is a, a ribosome initiating translation. It's about to grab onto the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. And we're going to see this little uh, uh, black protein. This is the protein being made, uh, the amino acids. And we're going to see that get kind of shoved into uh, the endoplasmic reticulum. So there's a signal on this messenger RNA that's triggering that process. And you can see I'm buying time right now so we can see it go and bind to it. It's about to do it. I swear it's gonna bind to it really soon. It's gonna be great. It's gonna squirt it in there. Oh, oh, okay, there it grabbed on. See that was the signaling peptide. It's trans oh, it's transferring to the ER. There we go. Brings it over. And now we're going to push the rest of that amino acid chain into the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is outside the endoplasmic reticulum, like in the cytosol or cytoplasm. And then this is going into the ER. And you'll see this chain, it's growing here. We're gonna see it start popping out right here. 
And that's how you would either uh, have a protein that you want to secrete, like in a vesicle. And so you just put a bunch of them in here. Or what you could do is have this protein, let's say it's like a channel protein or something, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, and you could leave it embedded inside the membrane here, and then you could send that to the surface. And so that's kind of fun. Uh, but there is the smooth ER, there's the rough ER, uh, and uh, they just they have different jobs, but really the smooth ER can do other things as well, um, at, at just like the Golgi. So I'm actually going to jump ahead to the Golgi. I'm glossing over this a little bit uh, because uh, in a microbiology class, it's important that we talk about organelles, but we don't dig too deep. That tends to be more in like a cell biology class. Uh, now, the Golgi, its job is to modify proteins. Um, the Golgi's job is to tack on carbohydrates or lipids onto proteins. Usually we think about it making glycoproteins. So you're taking sugars and sticking them onto proteins, which is really important like for signaling or proper functionality of the proteins. You can modify your lipids there as well. So um, uh, your entire cell is made of phospholipid bilayers and sometimes you want to put proteins on there or sometimes you want to put carbohydrates on those lipids. And so that's the job of the Golgi. When a protein leaves the Golgi, or whatever is inside the Golgi, but it's usually a protein, uh, we can have it exit as a vesicle. And vesicles are just small little containers. They're small little uh, phospholipid bilayers that can hold on to stuff, which is really nice. And so it enters the cyst side and leaves via the trans side and it heads out towards the cell membrane. And you can see this is a nice electron micrograph. So this would be a transmission electron micrograph picture. Uh, and these are mitochondria over here, which we're gonna talk about in a second, which is pretty fun. So vesicles themselves, uh, there's actually more variety in vesicles than you would think. Usually we kind of make them really simple, like, hey, it's just like a little container, but that's a drastic oversimplification. Uh, vesicles come in a massive amount of sizes and shapes. You can even have um, vesicles that have multiple phospholipid bilayers in and of themselves, which is really cool. Um, and there's an entire world around how endomembrane systems and vesicles and all of these things are actually formed and then sent to different parts of the cell. It's really, really cool. And that's what this picture is sort of depicting a little bit. There's lots of proteins. Basically, you can coat the vesicles in something that directs it on where to go, which is really fun. Now, there are subspecialties of vesicles. Uh, so one of those would be lysosomes, and like I mentioned earlier, lysosomes, they're kind of like the garbage can of the cell, which I don't love that um, because they can have other jobs too, but really it's generally a place to sequester your enzymes that are going to chop stuff up. So it could be proteins, that's usually what we think about, uh, but it could be other stuff, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, <laughs> the everything, <laughs> so you just can send whatever you want into the lysosome and have it degraded, which is really, really fun. Peroxisomes are similar. Uh, their job really is to perform, uh, they're uh, an assistant to the mitochondria in many ways. So their job is to modify things, it's to keep track of um, reactive oxygen species, which is something we'll probably talk about a little bit later in this class. And it's also to uh, basically break down fats uh, because in the cytoplasm is where glycolysis occurs, that's where we break down sugar. And then in the mitochondria is where we kind of finish that job using the citric, citric acid cycle. Uh, but the, some of those intermediate steps, you can take uh, pieces of fat and break it down and then send that into the mitochondria to be broken down. Uh, and so that's how, like, like, I don't know, you're working out and you're trying to lose some weight and you got to break down some of those fats. Uh, then you'll send them into a peroxisome. Uh, and so uh, you tend, uh, you also keep track of peroxide and can break it down and use it for different things in the peroxisome. That's why they got their name, but I actually kind of consider them more like fatty acid breakdown machines. So that's kind of fun. Uh, plants uh, and other animals too that undergo photosynthesis have chloroplasts, which are double membraned machines that take sh uh, carbon dioxide and water and they convert that into sugar and oxygen, uh, which is uh, sort of the opposite of combustion. So if we're, uh, normally we take sugar with oxygen and we burn it or undergo respiration inside of a mitochondria, which I'm about to talk about, and we make energy alongside of carbon dioxide and water. And so when you do the opposite thing, like a plant, then you use a chloroplast, which is fun. Uh, if you take a botany course, uh, you'll talk about that. In this class, we'll talk a little bit about them, uh, but in, we tend to talk more about that in like a botany course. Uh, mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, which is probably my least favorite term for the mitochondria because just look at this picture. There's a lot of things. This is not a full list of all the different things that mitochondria can do. But of course, energy metabolism is one of the main jobs of a mitochondria. Uh, in, in general, it's in the uh, inner membrane here, this intermembrane, so you've got your outer membrane, inner membrane, and then you have the space in between. We call that the intermembrane space because, well, why call it something different? The inside is called the matrix, but in that uh, phospholipid bilayer right here inside is where we put our 
electron transport chain, which is something that we talk about in like biochemistry. If uh, that's where uh, the citric acid cycle occurs in here, and then you take those byproducts, send them to the electron transport chain, and that's where you put hydrogens in the intramembrane space and allow them to pass back into the matrix. And that makes ATP, which is what powers every living thing on the planet. Uh, they're also responsible for tons of other stuff. One of the big ones being apoptosis. That one's a really cool one that I always liked with mitochondria, but there's a bunch of other things too. Uh, fun fact, mitochondria have their own DNA. It's called mitochondrial DNA, and they have their own ribosomes. They have a lot of their own things, which is very cool. So now we're going to move from eukaryotes into prokaryotes, bacteria, archaea. We're focusing on bacteria for this class. They're simpler. Of course, though that doesn't mean that we know everything, they're just simpler than a eukaryotic cell for the most part. Uh, they do not have membrane-bound organelles. The only phospholipid bilayer for the most part that we see in bacteria is this inner one right here. Okay, so the outer cell membrane, plasma membrane listed here. Uh, bacteria have cell walls though because in general they exist as individual organisms. Now when they get as a collection of bacteria, they can start to do funny things as biofilms, but for the most part, bacteria hang out by themselves, and so they have a nice cell wall to protect them from stuff. And they can also have a nice glycocalyx or a capsule on the outside too. And so you can see it's, it's a very thick outer layer, that cell wall. Uh, bacteria do have ribosomes as well. Uh, structurally, they're very similar. They also perform translation. I'm not going to go into bacterial ribosomes in this class, I don't think. Um, but for the most part, like they do look a little different, so that's a one way that we can study bacteria, but they perform the same job. They take RNA and turn it into proteins. Uh, and so we're going to work our way. Uh, so with a eukaryote, we started on the, with the nucleus and moved, worked our way out, and then we're going to work our way back in from the outside of a bacteria. So let's start with that glycocalyx. So the glycocalyx is a generic term for either what we call a slime layer or a capsule. So if it's water soluble uh, and sticky and gross and weird looking, that's generally a slime layer. And if it's water insoluble, we call that a capsule. Uh, and I've, I'm of course kind of glossing over a lot of stuff. I mean, people spend their entire careers studying these things. Uh, so it's mostly protein and polysaccharides. So that's a lot of proteins with lots of sugars stuck on them. And they extend really, really far out into the extracellular matrix of the bacteria. So here's your, your, your core cell wall of your bacteria, which we're going to talk about, and then you've got that glycocalyx sticking out. Uh, if it's really, really dense, it's a capsule, which I'm going to talk about a capsule in just a minute. And what they do is they, uh, remember bacteria are just kind of hanging out by themselves, and so they don't have uh, like uh, your skin to protect you from things. Uh, they don't have this outer set of cells to protect them, so they have to protect themselves. And so that's the function of the capsule in many ways. So the capsule can protect against big changes in the environment. So pH being a huge one, uh, being attacked by things like the immune system or other bacteria, um, being washed away. So if you're a nice sticky slime layer that helps you stick to stuff. And so a lot of biofilms, which we'll talk about later in this class, uh, biofilms are just a, an amalgamation of a bunch of bacteria and their slime layers and they're all stuck together. It's really gross. Capsules themselves can be major virulence factors, and so I want to talk about one specifically. So Streptococcus pneumoniae causes a ton of pneumonia every year, uh, lots of ear infections as well. Uh, so statistically, if you get an ear infection, it's probably Streptococcus pneumoniae. Uh, it kills millions of people, uh, mostly kids under the age of five and old people, uh, because it gets in your lungs and it kills you. Uh, there are different versions, though, and some of them are more virulent or can cause uh, worse disease or actually cause disease than others. And one of the virulence factors, which is what we talk about, um, what, what makes this bacteria virulent versus avirulent, um, which when we get further into the class, we'll talk about like viruses and bacteria and pathogens. Sometimes there's versions of them that don't hurt people and there's versions that do hurt people. And the virulence factor is what makes them hurt you. And the capsule can be one of those things. Uh, and what the capsule on strep pneumonia can do is it can disable complement, which we'll talk about when we talk about the immune system, and also phagocytosis. So that's when your immune system, like your neutrophils or your macrophages, are coming along and they're trying to eat things. So people have usually heard of phagocytosis when you see that macrophage trying to gobble up bad guys. And so the capsule protects, it's this nice outer layer of protection against phagocytosis. And so the bacteria is able to survive the immune system and it's able to resist being killed. If you do get a Streptococcus pneumonia infection, you'll probably be given some form of penicillin, either penicillin V, which would be for like a mild disease, they can give that to you orally, 
or if you have it really, really bad, then they'll give it to you via an IV injection, and that's penicillin G. Uh, penicillin has a nice core, uh, this square core we're going to talk about when we talk about uh, antibiotics and why this core looks super weird. It should really bother you that there's a square right here in this chemical structure. That's really, really strange. And we're going to talk about why that's strange when we talk about antibiotics. So that's the capsule, which is the glycocalyx of a bacteria. Eukaryotes can also have glycocalyces. Uh, in fact, you do lining the inner layer of all your uh, blood vessels. So the endothelial cells secrete a glycocalyx into the lumen of the vessel. So that's like the inside of the vessels. And it does a couple things. Uh, it basically kind of reduces the amount of potential damage and the, the literal physics, the physical stress that can be induced on your endothelial cells. Because uh, having your blood pressure as high as it is in a human, uh, that can really damage stuff. And so uh, we call that shear stress. So um, this comes from a paper that talks about shear stress and why the glycocalyx is important. It turns out if you start having atherosclerosis or you're aging or like you smoke or a variety of other things that will destroy the glycocalyx, that this nice hairy looking stuff on the inside of your endothelial cells, what that can do is it can increase the amount of shear stress uh, and that can cause uh, a burst. It could break that vessel and now you've just had a broken vessel. If that happens in your brain, well, that's not good. Uh, it also helps with immune cells when they need to attach. It gives them something to grab onto uh, as platelets as well uh, when they're trying to seal off a wound. Uh, your mucosa can also have, um, it's up for debate whether you want to consider it a glycocalyx. As somebody who worked on mucosal cells and vaccines for mucosa, I would consider it a glycocalyx. Uh, and so you have your intestinal lining here with your uh, intestinal cells, and uh, they secrete uh, mucus. We all know that there's mucus on mucosal layers, hence mucosal, uh, and it acts as a barrier for entry, and there's uh, the mucus itself, as well as some other things that are stuck on the cells, could be considered a glycocalyx, and it can really keep bad guys out. Now, if you're a really pathogenic bacteria, maybe you have a way to get through that inner mucus layer, which is really, really dense. Uh, but uh, otherwise, most bacteria kind of hang out inside the intestinal lumen, which is up there. But uh, in this case, not only do bacteria have glycocalyces, but uh, eukaryotes do as well. So this is just one example. So now we're going to move on. We're going to talk about motility. So I've got some, some gifts here. Usually flagella and cilia are the two things that we tend to talk about, okay? So there's a sperm, of course, on the left there. Using a flagella. Flagella are really interesting the way that they're actually used sort of varies, and it's still up for debate how they actually spin and make things move. So it kind of looks snake-like, but that can sometimes be a byproduct. I, I don't want to say poor microscopy, but like as our understanding of microscopy and our ability to look at things has improved, we can actually see that how um, flagella are actually used is a little different. But Sometimes, for the most part, it looks kind of like a corkscrew motion. It's up for debate, and do bacteria use their flagella the same way that like a sperm would? Probably not. Um, I watched an interesting video that talks about how to actually get this undulating motion in a sperm uh, is actually controlled by which side of the proteins that are controlling the contraction. Uh, are actually on or off and how to turn them on and off is really interesting. Now cilia is actually pretty common. We see them a lot. Uh, here we have a nice paramecium, some kind of cilia. And what I want you to focus on is right here in the center of the cilia. You can see that waving motion right through the middle. Very, very interesting. And so that's very classic to how cilia beat. Uh, and you saw an image of the cilia in that first video that I showed. Uh, where they show that undulating motion is what we would call it. And here we have it like in the uh, like in your nasopharynx, uh, like in your nasal lining or in your lungs, to have the cilia beat together and that allows them to push the mucus, which is containing whatever bad guys, bacteria, stuff like that, it can dirt, it can push it back out. And how cilia function versus flagella is different. Um, cilia will actually kind of, they literally look more like this. There's a lot that goes into the physics of cilia and flagella, so if you want to study that. But they beat in a very interesting pattern that allows them to push things along, and so it's it's kind of cool. Stentacoruleus is a part of a group called the ciliates. As is true of all ciliates, Stentacoruleus have hair-like structures called cilia. 
The beating of the cilia propels these cells in the water when they want to move around, and it also brings food particles, microanimals, and single-celled organisms into the cell mouth, where they are taken inside the cell to be digested just like this multicellular rotifer, which is swallowed by the giant stentor coeruleus and waiting to be digested. We recorded this struggle for a long time and even witnessed the rotifer rupturing the stentor's cell membrane multiple times. Each time, the stentor repaired itself and the rotifer never managed to escape. After 25 minutes, the rotifer ceased its struggle. Just a reminder, rotifers have a simple brain and a simple nervous system. They can feel, I'm not sure about pain, but they can certainly feel stimuli. Something else that we see uh, as far as motility is something called an axial filament or an endoflagella. So as opposed to a flagella, which I just talked about, an endoflagella is where you sort of take, uh, instead of having the flagella stick off the side of the bacteria or the sperm or whatever it is, uh, you can actually kind of stick it onto the bacteria itself. So it sort of travels along it. So it looks like a snake. And so this would be like a spirochete looking bacteria. And we see that in like Lyme disease, uh, which is Borrelia burgdorferi. And we see that in syphilis, which is Treponema pallidum pallidum. Uh, but there are other diseases that are not STDs, like syphilis is considered an STD or an STD I know. And there are other ones, especially endemic in like sub-Saharan Africa. So Bedgel, Yaws, and Pinta are all just different subspecies of Treponema pallidum. And they cause similar disease uh, as syphilis, but they'll cause it all over your body. It's not an STD per se. It's just maybe you stepped on uh, something and it got in your body. Or they, they use this spiral motion to sort of dig their way into your cells, which is terrifying. And primary, you get this little uh, like a little pustule-looking thing, but then it gets worse, and it gets really bad. And um, syphilis is known, at least back in the day, uh, it'll get into your bones and start eating your bones away. So there's terrifying pictures of, like, the 1700s prostitutes with, like, rotting faces because they've had syphilis for their entire life. Uh, it's really scary stuff. Now we're going to move on to some of the other outer structures that get brought up uh, before we get a little bit deeper and get into the cell wall. So the only really two big outer structures that I like to talk about are fimbri. So you can see on this picture here, we've got our fimbri. They're basically designed, they're long protein extensions. They almost make the bacteria look like a porcupine or something, and they allow it to stick to stuff. That's generally their job. Uh, sex pili are sometimes lumped together with fimbri. They are not the same thing. Sex pili are, tend to be longer. So if this is a flagella, then maybe this would be a sex pili that would stop like right here. And sex pili, here's an example down here, uh, this one is extending its sex pili out to this other bacteria. So this is an E. coli talking to another E. coli. Uh, we call them sex pili to make them sound fun, but basically they're exchanging genetic material. And so they will exchange uh, plasmids often. Uh, and so we call this conjugation when one bacteria conjugates as a male with another bacteria, which we consider the female, and it donates its genetic material to that other one, which is to the both bacteria's advantage, because uh, if this is like a, another E. coli, then I can transmit maybe uh, antibiotic resistance, and as a species, I can be more successful, and that tends to be the, the point. So now we're going to move uh, deeper inside of our bacteria, and we're going to move on to cell walls. So this is arguably one of the most important things that we'll talk about in this class and learn. So the cell walls of a bacteria are usually very thick, uh, and they're designed to maintain the bacteria's shape and help it resist damage in many different ways. So, I mean, it could be atmospheric pressure, because um, some bacteria live deep in the ocean, so there's a lot of pressure there. Um, it could be mechanical pressure, so like if the bacteria gets crushed by something or gets underneath something, I don't know. Uh, or osmotic pressure, so if the bacteria moves from like a pretty saline solution to an, a non-saline solution, um, that osmotic pressure could cause damage if it didn't have a nice cell wall to maintain that shape. Uh, and it also acts as just like a nice scaffold, just like our cells have our cell membranes that we can embed things in to talk, have our cells talk to each other, uh, bacteria do the exact same thing. Now, in general, there are two classifications for bacterial cell walls. This is very, very important. There are gram-positive bacterial cell walls, and there are gram-negative bacterial cell walls. And we tend to classify bacteria into one of those two camps. They're either gram-positive or gram-negative. That's like the first thing that you're going to do when you're trying to diagnose someone. Like, is it a gram-positive or a gram-negative bacteria? And that you use a gram stain to do that, which is something that we will do in our lab. Gram-positive bacteria, on the top you have a gram-positive 
they stain deep purple under a gram stain. Uh, and it's they have this nice thick layer of peptidoglycan. So peptidoglycan uh, is a uh, it's a bunch of peptides which are proteins and glycan which is sugars. And so it's this really interesting structure of sugars and peptides that are all bound together, and they just uh, provide a lot of nice dense scaffolding to protect your cell and give, uh, help it maintain its shape. Uh, it's very very thick. Um, it's arguably even thicker than this. This is a smaller one because it could probably be double or even triple this size, but you know, then you're wasting a lot of space. But uh, that sits on top of the cell membrane or the phospholipid bilayer of the cell that you can embed things in. You can also embed things in the peptidoglycan as well. Uh, now, gram-negative bacteria have a really thin, uh, some would argue almost non-existent layer of peptidoglycan. So they still have peptidoglycan. It's really, really narrow. So instead of being 20 to 80 nanometers, it's like two or three nanometers. It's very, very thin. And that's sandwiched between two lipid bilayers, okay? So you have your normal inner cell lipid bilayer, and you have your outer membrane or outer phospholipid bilayer. And this outer layer can have something that we call lipopolysaccharide. Uh, and so this outer, so there's two layers, right? There's the one set of phospholipids and then another set of phospholipids. And the ones that sit on top can have lipo, lipid, polysaccharide. And so you can see it says polysaccharide here. And so if you stick a lipid on there, so that's like, you know, fats, uh, and it has a very specific structure. And why am I bringing that up? Because that's a hallmark of gram-negative bacteria is LPS or lipopolysaccharide. And it's what our immune systems see and start freaking out about. Because if you see LPS, that means there is some kind of gram-negative bacteria hanging out and that is not a good thing. And so you, we have built-in mechanisms to detect LPS, as well as a variety of other things, flagella being another one. Now I wanted to talk just a little bit about uh, those specific structures. So there's lots of things that we can embed in them. That's what I'm trying to kind of drive home here. Uh, just a different picture to look at. Uh, you can have proteins embedded in there. Uh, you can have uh, acids. Uh, well, you can have like fatty acids, uh, these nice big lipid fat things stuck in there. You can see they're, they're bridging the gap between the actual peptidoglycan layer and the underlying phospholipid bilayer, which is cool. So this is a gram-positive bacteria. Gram-negatives got that nice thin layer. I'm really emphasizing this because this is really, really important. The name for the space between these two phospholipid bilayers, so we got one phospholipid bilayer or your cell membrane, and then you have your outer membrane, which you can see it looks very different, right? So this is the LPS. So these are their, um, these extensions. So lipo, meaning the lipids, polysaccharide, okay? So there's your LPS. So these are a bunch of sugars. So poly, meaning more than one, saccharide being sh sugars. And so you can see all these sugars are sticking off. And so we call that LPS. And so you can see they, the lipid layers look kind of different, but there are two of them. And the gap between these, we call the periplasmic space because it sounds super cool. That's what a gram-negative bacteria looks like. But you can see we have lots of things embedded in there as well. And because this is a cell membrane, you can embed lots of things in here. And this actually allows gram-negative bacteria to resist uh, lots of things that might kill other bacteria. I, gram positives because they have this outer membrane and so you can take a, let's say an antibiotic was trying to kill your bacteria well it's only going to get through this first phospholipid bilayer and then I can eject it back out uh, before it actually destroys my cell membrane which is kind of cool. Speaking of cell membranes uh, there are a, a, one big exception in general between gram positives which on this slide is over here here's a gram negative bacteria this would be drastically bigger this thickness of phospholipid bilayer, or this peptidoglycan right here. Uh, so we've got our gram positive over here, we've got our gram negative. Mycobacteria look a little different. Uh, mycobacteria, that would be like tuberculosis or non-TB mycobacteria. And uh, we use different stains, so you'd use like an acid fast stain instead of a gram stain if you were trying to differentiate. Because uh, mycobacteria have this really weird structure. So instead of LPS, like I was talking about, they can have this thing called mycolic acid. Hence, mycobacteria or mycolic acid. And it's just this giant glycolipid, giant, crazy polysaccharide looking thing that sticks off. And it makes staining them kind of weird. And so what you'll, you can get is, we call them gram variable. Uh, 
So if you're trying to do a gram stain, which is how we establish is a gram positive or gram negative, and it just isn't working well, then maybe you should do an acid fast stain and see if you have a mycobacteria infection. Um, and then over here, I have a fungus, which I'm going to jump to the next slide too, because uh, there's more examples of funguses. So yeast being the most common example of funguses that we see. Uh, but fungal membranes are different. They do have cell walls, just like plants do and just like bacteria do. But funguses are eukaryotes. They're not uh, bacteria or archaea. Uh, but you can see here, we've got some chitin down here. That's kind of the classic polysaccharide that we would see in funguses. And you can see, a lot, depending on the kind of fungus it is, the more variety you can have in their cell wall, which is really, really cool. And it just gives them different things. Like they've got lots of different kinds of sugars. Some have galactose, some have other mannan. There's all kinds of variety that exists, which is the spice of life. So we've been talking about cell walls, and now we need to move on to the next inner piece, which is the cell membrane. And so you can see every one of these things that we've been talking about shares that in common. They've got these cell membranes. Okay? So those are our phospholipid bilayers. So we need to talk about those and talk about uh, you know, what actually comprises a phospholipid bilayer. Why are they so important? So cell membranes are really the, the scaffolding and the barrier to entry and exit into a cell or into an organelle, if you want. Uh, and they're extremely dynamic. They're not just these just walls that are just sitting there. They're selectively permeable, which is one of the most important things. We're going to talk about that. Now, in general, their structure is phospholipid. So a phospholipid has a charged head. Okay, So that's these little silver looking egg looking things here. And then they have these long chains of carbons and hydrogens sticking off of them. And so that's the lipid portion. So you've got your charged head, which doesn't have to have a phosphate, uh, but we just tend to call them phospholipids, which you take a biochemistry course, we'll talk more about that. But uh, phospholipids, and then they've got this long chain carbon, that's the lipid part. And so these are hydrophobic inner parts here with the uh, the lipid part, and then the heads are charged, so they're hydrophilic. And so uh, that they naturally form this nice uh, structure here. Uh, they also contain, uh, usually actually at a one-to-one -one ratio, uh, cholesterol, or at least some kind of sterol. In humans, we see cholesterol, or in mammals in general. Uh, other creatures can have different kinds of sterols. Uh, plants will have phytosterols. Uh, there's a variety of those. Um, funguses will have ergosterols. And so it just depends on the kind of creature you are. It's just one of those minor things. Uh, the sterols aren't actually that different, but they're different enough that we can give them different names, which is fun. Uh, and so you can see they're connected. So your phospholipid bilayer isn't just this, this magic thing, this wall that's just sitting there. It's an integral part of everything inside and outside of the cell. It connects to everything. And being a scaffold to embed your proteins in is so important because it lets you connect not just to the cytoskeleton, but also to the extracellular matrix. And so that allows you to communicate. It allows you to uh, move. It's just awesome. It's really, really important. So membranes have a couple of key functions, being permeable or semi-permeable to different things. So if it's really small and not charged, uh, then it can usually pass through. So most gases can pass through, water can pass through, um, some vitamins can pass through, uh, but a lot of things cannot pass through, and that's really important. So having that nice barrier allows us to control what comes in and out. Uh, acting as a scaffold or a protein anchor is also really important for, uh, I mean, your mitochondria won't be able to make ATP if you couldn't embed a protein inside their phospholipid bilayers, and so that's really important. Uh, and we also see that used uh, on a, a larger scale, like for the axon of a neuron, being able to put a, a specific charge on one side versus a negative charge on the inside. So like it's positive on the outside, negative on the inside, and it creates that gradient, which allows us to, uh, you know, have an axon actually function. And we, we see that consistent through a lot of things. This is actually similar to how a mitochondria would maybe put all of its hydrogens on one side of a membrane, and then we allow them to pass through in a controlled way, and that allows us to actually make energy. So speaking of permeability, we always got to talk about osmosis. That's the movement of water, which on the planet Earth is our solvent. Uh, and our solvent likes to go from uh, a low concentration of stuff to a high concentration of stuff that's different from itself. So like if uh, usually we're thinking about like salts, and so, but it could be anything. Uh, so our cells are full of all kinds of stuff. That's what we've been talking about, right? And so water tends to want to balance it out because the stuff can't pass through the membrane, but water can. And so water wants to balance that out. And so if you're in an isotonic solution, the amount of water coming in versus the amount of water coming out is the same. It's balanced. But if you take a cell and you uh, take that cell and you put it into a solution of water that uh, is really salty, so that solution is very hypertonic, uh, 
So that would be on the left here. So these red blood cells have been placed in like a jar that has uh, salt water in it. And the water inside the cells moves out towards the solute because there's more salt outside of the cell. The opposite can also be true. And so if you took your red blood cell and you put them in a solution that has like no water, so it's like distilled water or something, there's no salts in there, then uh, it would explode because all the water wants to rush back into the cell because there's more stuff inside the cell than outside the cell. And so they, they burst. Uh, so the cells kind of die either way, but it just depends on how they die. Water is one of those things that can just move back and forth, but lots of things can't. And so we have to allow for transport. So that's where 10% uh, of the human genome is based on transport-related proteins, which is should really impress you. Uh, we don't go into too much detail in this class, uh, but there are different kinds of transport. So simple diffusion would be like water moving or uh, gas exchange. They're going from high to low is generally what you're doing. Uh, so a high concentration on one side of a membrane to a low concentration. And when that happens, uh, if it can freely pass through the membrane, awesome. That's It's just diffusion, it's passing. If we facilitate that diffusion, then we are allowing it to go from a high concentration to a low concentration, uh, but maybe this thing can't normally freely pass through the membrane, so you build like a little channel, or you build a transporter that it's still going from high to low, uh, but it's just uh, allowing that to happen. That's facilitating the diffusion. If you need to go against a gradient, okay, so gradient is from high to low, so if I need to go from low to high, that is defying a gradient. Things don't like to do that, and so you have to spend a little bit of energy to actually do that. And so that's where we see active transport. Uh, most of the time we think of active transport as requiring ATP. Uh, they don't necessarily have to. Uh, you could use a, another gradient to drive that, uh, but for the most part, like for this class, active transport generally requires some kind of energy usually it's going to be ATP. Now, a membrane transport can also include vesicular transport, so that's vesicles, that's the endomembrane system. And so we talked about that earlier, where you can make a vesicle and send it into the ER, or send it out to the cell, and then expel it out that way. And so I have just some examples of that down here. So phagocytosis being one of those. So we usually think about membrane transport being taking things from outside of a cell, uh, the extracellular matrix, and bring it inside of the cell into the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is just everything inside the cell, basically. Uh, that's a catch-all term for, that we use for the inside. Uh, the cytosol is the actual liquid component, but the cytoplasm is the stuff inside. Uh, so that's in all of our cells, uh, and eukaryotic cells and bacteria, but we're focusing on bacteria right now. So I wanted to hit just the last couple organelles that exist for bacteria. Now, we don't call them organelles. Organelle is kind of a term for a membrane-bound thing. And so we're just going to say, like, okay, this this thing inside of a bacteria, like, how do a bacteria keep themselves organized? Uh, well, they have to keep their nuclear material somewhere, so that's their chromosomes, right? So bacteria have DNA just like your cells do. And instead of letting it just kind of float everywhere, which is how sometimes it's depicted, that's not actually true. Bacteria are far more organized than we give them credit for. And so when they take their DNA and they organize it and condense it down nice and tight, uh, they have their chromosomes, and we call that the nucleoid. Now, there is not a layer around it, okay, at least not a phospholipid bilayer, but you do kind of keep it uh, sequestered, so you can use proteins in the cytoskeleton to do that. Bacteria in general, so bacteria in general, have one to two circular or linear chromosomes. Uh, archaea tend to have a few more. Plasmids are really small circular pieces of DNA that contain a few genes, one, two, three, four, uh, but not a ton. Uh, most bacteria are going to have a ton of genes, like hundreds of genes potentially, in their chromosome. Plasmids, they're almost like the trading cards of bacteria. So you could have a plasmid that has like uh, some kind of virulence factor that lets you infect macrophages and you could swap it with somebody else. Uh, via like conjugation, or maybe your friend bacteria dies and you can eat his trading cards or whatever. Uh, but you can see here, just got a, a nicer picture here of uh, an E. coli genome, which has 4.6 million base pairs and tons of genes, and they're all organized in this nice glob. And then inside the actual cell, it's uh, it, the nucleoid itself actually has some nice structure to it, which is really cool. Bacteria also have, uh, just like we have vesicles and endomembranes and ways to keep our things organized, our lysosomes, our peroxisomes, bacteria also have areas of, uh, we call them inclusions or inclusion bodies. And those are storage areas for doing stuff. Uh, so like if you want to store things for later, like you, you make extra glycogen to use uh, for fat storage or sugar storage. So uh, save it for a rainy day, why not? Uh, certain bacteria will have vesicles, uh, we can call them vesicles as well, 
uh, inclusions is probably the better term so that you don't get confused. Uh, but uh, vesicles, uh, you could have gas vesicles, which is really cool. So certain bacteria will, they'll make a gas, which kind of makes them float. And so they can kind of control how deep or not deep they are inside water, which is cool. Um, you could store sulfur in there. There are certain bacteria that uh, we call them magnetotactic bacteria. Uh, they're like little magnets, basically, inside of their uh, inclusions, and it allows them to uh, orient themselves to the magnetic poles of the Earth, which is really, really cool. The last thing I want to talk about is something that we don't see in eukaryotic cells, but we do see in the phylum Formicutes, which is a really huge phylum of bacteria, uh, and they can form endospores. Uh, and endospores are like this seed of a bacteria that can sit for essentially forever. They're basically almost non-living states of bacteria. They're frozen in time. And if a bacteria undergoes a certain amount of environmental stress, they can induce that dormant state. Uh, they basically form uh, the spore inside of themselves, and then the rest of the bacteria sort of dies off and it leaves the spore behind. And so uh, vegetative is a term for just a normal functioning cell. It's not like how we think of vegetative state. Uh, like in humans, like, oh, he's a vegetable because he's stuck on a ventilator and he, his brain isn't working anymore. That's different. Um, in small things, vegetative means like their normal existing state, like a vegetable that's growing in the ground or something. I don't know. Uh, and so uh, if you go from a vegetative state and you induce uh, some kind of environmental response uh, that's a stressor on a bacteria, they're usually bacilli. They can form a spore and you can see the spores here. Uh, and those are all essentially indestructible. I mean, you can kill them. Uh, fire is probably the best way to kill them. Uh, but you can irradiate them. You can desiccate them. You can throw bleach on them. You can do all kinds of stuff. If you're not throwing it in a really nice autoclave and heating it really hot or burning it with fire to burn it, then they're probably going to survive. And it can happen really, really fast, uh, which is really scary. Uh, we see that uh, commonly in soil bacteria. So soil bacteria, uh, Bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax, being one of those, uh, these are anthrax spores right here. And so you may have heard of, like in the, uh, after September 11th, uh, early 2000s, someone was mailing anthrax spores. Uh, it was really scary. I was in high school at the time. And uh, that's what they were sending. They were mailing these spores and the spores, they uh, you breathe them in, they get in your lungs, and then they reactivate. And now you have anthrax in your lungs and anthrax is really scary. And it takes some hardcore antibiotics to kill. And so that was really scary. So anthrax is a bioterrorism, but you can never get rid of anthrax because it lives in the soil and it forms spores. And <laughs> how could you ever get rid of all of them? There's probably quadrillions of them living in the soil all over the earth. And with that, that is going to end our lecture on cell anatomy.